Hi folks, welcome in. As you get settled, uh, we will begin in just a couple minutes here. Welcome to San Diego 101 for May. Welcome, welcome to introducing the Aquin family, the first Chinese family in San Diego's early Chinatown. San Diego 101 for May, and we'll start in just a moment. All right, looks like our numbers are settling, so let's get started right on time. Uh, welcome to San Diego 101 for May. I'm Sam, I'm from the San Diego History Center, and I am here to introduce this topic and our speakers. Uh, we will be hearing from Susie Castle and Cindy Quinsu, uh, who will be talking about the Aquin family. Uh, many of you might be familiar, but maybe don't know the whole story. So we're hoping to learn about that today. We will have you here until about one o'clock. Our speakers uh, will present, and then afterward, we'll spend the remaining minutes on Q&A. So if you have any questions that occur to you during the program and during their talk, please do use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, if you've got a connection to share or wanna say hello, please use the chat function, uh, but make sure if you've got any questions, they get into our Q&A, because we don't wanna lose track of them in the chat. Uh, and without further ado, I will pass it to our speakers. Hello, and as Samantha mentioned, my name is Cindy Sue, and I'm proud to share the story about my paternal great-grandfather, Ah Quinn. He immigrated from China and settled in San Diego in the 1880s. And he came to San Diego um, to be the Chinese labor broker for the creation of the California Southern Railroad. He also became a successful merchant and had an interest in farming and real estate and mining. And because his English was better than most Chinese in that era, he became a translator for the San Diego and also the Santa Barbara courts. Um, and through those connections, he became friends with many important leaders in San Diego, such as Alonzo Horton and George Marston. Um, in the community, he was respected by all and was considered the unofficial mayor of Chinatown. So this is one of San Diego's immigrants' stories. His success in America is a story of his willingness to leave the familiarity of his original country, his ability to adapt to a whole new and often hostile culture, and to finally call San Diego his home and raise his large family. All this history would have been lost to time, but fortunately, he left a wealth of information in his diaries that Susie will speak to later. So we start the story by traveling back in time, and I'll show you through photos how I'm related to Ah Quinn. Uh, oh, yes, this one, thank you. This is my family, and I'm on the left, and then my son Abe is next to me, and my daughter Ashley, and then my husband, Alex, and my son, Brandon. Next. This is my father's family, my parents, Alan and Maria Quinn. To the, and to the right, uh, my parents are sitting surrounded by their four children. I'm the oldest of the siblings. Um, my parents also had nine grandchildren, but three of the children are missing from this photo. Next. This is my grandfather, George's family. On the left there are all his children and the youngest one is my father, Alan. Um, and on the right are my grandparents, George and my grandmother, Mi Ji, and their oldest child, Georgia. My grandfather, George, was Aquin's second child. Next. And going back to the first generation in America is my great grandfather, Ah Quinn. Um, I'll show you photos of his family uh, later on in the presentation. 
Next. Ah Quinn was born December 5th, 1848 in Southern China in a city that is pronounced Kaiping in Mandarin and Hoiping in Cantonese. He was the eldest of three children and um, he had two younger brothers. One came to America and passed away in Santa Barbara and the other brother stayed in China. Aquin's real last name in Chinese is pronounced Tan in Mandarin, like the author Amy Tan of the Joy Luck Club. It is also pronounced Tom in Cantonese. Tom or Hom is commonly used. Next. Here's a map showing you where the city of Kaiping is located. And Guangzhou is the new name for the city of Canton. The distance between those two cities is about 76 miles. And as you can see in the inset, Kaiping is located in the southern part of China. Next. This slide shows how to write Aquin's name, uh, last name Tan in a Chinese character, or they also call a Chinese character a Hanzi. And you can see how this Hanzi character is pronounced differently uh, in different countries and also in different Chinese localities. So you can see in Vietnam, Tan is pronounced Dong. Next. This uh, slide depicts the ancient Tan totem. A long time ago, there was a small Tan kingdom and uh, the Tans reign um, about 1046 to 684 BC. And this is the totem that they used. Next. This slide depicts Aquin's signature in Hanzi. In Chinese, you say the surname first, followed by the two character first name. Since Aquin was Cantonese, he would have pronounced his name to the US Chinese immigration official as Tom Pak Kun. So I suspect that the immigration officer thought Kun was his last name and Americanized it and spelled it Quinn. Next. This is Aquin's village in Kaiping and Susie actually went to his village while she was doing research on him. And that's her standing in front of the gate. Um, the village name is Nan Zali, which means South Gate Township. And actually there's another gate on the other side of the village. Next. I have a couple more slides of the village. Um, I do want to mention that I haven't had the opportunity myself to visit the village yet. However, I did make contact with a representative of the Kaiping Overseas Affairs Office. Her name was Pecky Yang. And I asked her if she would help me find more information about Aquin. So I gave her, um, her the, uh, Aquin's Chinese Hanzi characters and the name of his village. And then she went with a colleague and walked up and down the village looking for the oldest person in the village who happened to be a hundred year old woman. And she and her son were responsible for uh, the village genealogy book. So everyone started looking in the book uh, and they, they did find my great grandfather's name in the book along with my great grandmother and my grandfather's name was in the book. So this village book goes back 30 generations and ties into the Tan surname city book, the county book, the state book, and the national book. My Tan lineage traces back 140 generations to the Yellow Emperor uh, around 2697 BC. Of course, I don't feel those early generations are that accurate since many documents were destroyed and had to be recreated. However, that is the official lineage of the Tans. And um, so that's a little history of the Aquins Chinese ancestral lineage. I think I have one more slide of the, of the village. And people actually still live in this village. 
Next. Like most Southern Chinese families, Ah Quinn's family was poor. His family couldn't afford to educate him. So he either uh, moved on his own or his entire family moved to Guangzhou. There, he most likely received a free education in American missionaries where he learned both Chinese and English. During that time period, China experienced wars and rebellions and floods, and many people were starving. I do have a document that showed Aquin's village had to share the meat among the villagers, and you probably were only able to eat meat um, a few times a month. Aquin knew his opportunities to find work were not good, so being the eldest son in the family, his parents sent him off to America uh, to earn money and, and to send money back home. And this was in 1868 when he was only 19 years old. So this is where I pass it on to Susie. Thank you, Cindy, for such excellent background. Next slide, please. I'm gonna pick it up in America. Um, since our focus is on San Diego today, I'll just briefly mention that Aquin landed in San Francisco like all of the immigrants from the Pacific at the time. And he stayed in San Francisco for just a few years as he studied more English in a Chinese mission home. He then moved to Santa Barbara where he helped to set up a Chinese mission home. And then he had the opportunity to go to Alaska to work as a cook for coal miners. And he wasn't just in you know, one of the big cities in Alaska. He was on this little tiny remote island called Unga Island on the bottom of the Shumigan chain. And he was cooking for coal miners for almost two years. It turned out that that coal was not very marketable. So he then left and came back to San Francisco where he worked again as a cook but this time for officers at the Presidio and at a camp um, on Angel Island called Camp Reynolds. When the railroad began developing in San Diego, he heard about it, I think through some of his Chinese kinsmen who were living in San Diego. And he gave one day's notice at the Presidio and he packed up and got on the steamer and arrived on his own in San Diego. Next slide, please. One of the remarkable things that he left behind, as Cindy has already told us, is his diaries. And we have 11 extant volumes, probably left behind for his 11 adult children. Um, they are 90% in English, but again, I think that we had many more volumes that he wrote that just haven't survived to history. 90% um, in English, the 10 or 15% that are written in Chinese are often marginalia. So he has address books, for instance. He was an incredible networker who kept track of almost everybody he met. And in the back of some of his volumes, he would write not just their addresses, but he might annotate them in, in Chinese characters. This is the man who gave me a really terrific broom, for instance. He also wrote some marginalia in the entries themselves. Um, he has one, for instance, about a, a white man who doesn't respect him, and he says that only in Chinese. I'm often asked, why did he write the diaries? And I think in this slide, we can see one good hint of that. The first two volumes, the bottom two in your slide on the right-hand corner, you can see the front cover of that diary says penmanship. So he began the diaries in penmanship books. And if you open the front cover of those first two volumes, you can see the English alphabet in cursive with you know, the little arrows that help to train people how to write in cursive. An S for instance, starts your pen at the very bottom and then comes up with little arrows and goes around. Um, those kinds of writing directions for cursive are in the first pages of his first two diaries. So one answer to the question of why he even wrote a diary is that he was practicing his English. Um, there are other answers, and I think the audience changes as time goes on, but that's at least one of the reasons he started the diaries. Now, the diaries, in my opinion, tell of what I call the dark ages of Chinese American history. Most of them come, all of them come, before the 1906 earthquake that hit San Francisco and essentially burned up almost all of the records of Chinese America prior to that great earthquake. So here in especially the San Francisco volumes, we have a very rare personal history of San Francisco's Chinatown. 
Aquin also writes about some of the landmark experiences of Chinese as a cook, as in this case, a, a railroad labor recruiter, not a railroad laborer himself, but someone who was working on the railroads. He also talks about less common experiences, like being someone who converted to Christianity and someone who was able to have a family of his own. The diaries were donated to the San Diego History Center here in his, um, in his home city by his great, I'm sorry, by his grandson, Thomas Kong. And in the letter, in the donation letter, Dr. Kong says, so we're very, very grateful to the Quinn family for donating these diaries and making them accessible for scholars. We've learned so much that we wouldn't know about Chinese American history and an anti-immigrant age by reading Auckland's personal texts. Next slide, please. I wanted to give you some samples of what the diary actually looks like. And inside the diary, this is from volume two. This is a diary that he transcribed entirely in this very beautiful telegraphic script. Um, and if you look closer at the diary, you notice that most of the pages in this volume two are copied biblical verses. So you can see he talks here about Hebrews. He talks about Moses, right? He's um, copying biblical verses potentially to, to learn them better or maybe as he's testifying his good acts before his God. Look at the upper left-hand corner. I put a, a green box around the date. Notice that on almost every diary page throughout the 25 years, he includes not only the American Gregorian calendar date, in this case, May 17th, Friday, but he also includes the Chinese date. Here it says Chinese Chai 4, April 15th. And that refers to the fourth year of the Chinese emperor Guangxi, and it's the lunar calendar date, April 15th. So again, he's bicultural and he never forgets his roots. 25 years on almost every page, he includes that Chinese calendar date along with the American calendar date. Next slide, please. A good cook, he keeps his recipes private. Right, so one of the things that he also writes in Chinese are his recipes. And here is one page. There are about 15 or 20 in the back of some of his diaries. These are read from right to left and in column form. And the kinds of things that he cooked included both American dishes, Asian American dishes, and Asian dishes. So for instance, he talks about making sponge cake. He talks about making beef and lamb pie. What I'm calling Asian fusion is a dish like Chinese tuber with grilled beef uh, or tomatoes and rice. And he also has a recipe for Northern soy sauce. Next, next slide, please. If you know the history of Chinese in San Diego, you know that it begins with Chinese fishermen. And these are men who probably were working in the gold mines in Northern California, but they were, they were driven out of those gold mines, both by foreign miners taxes that taxed them indiscriminately, discriminately, and then also by a hostile environment from both white as well as European miners. So many Chinese were driven out of those gold mines. And these Chinese in particular came 500 miles north in order to fish off the waters of San Diego. So at its height, the Chinese fishing industry in the 1880s had 18 junks, these specialized Chinese fishing boats, and about 60 Chinese fishermen. They specialized in catching shrimp and abalone, abalone being a, a delicacy among Chinese even now, um, and they dried the shrimp and the abalone, and then they shipped them back to San Francisco for export, mostly back to China. The abalone shells were also prepared and shipped back to San Francisco, and in that case, often into European cities. Next slide, please. The Chinese fishermen had a village right here in downtown San Diego, right at the base of 3rd and 4th streets. And that was the larger of the two Chinese fishing villages in San Diego. The other was on the other side in Point Loma. Um, you can see that Chinatown developed right around these Chinese fishing villages. In fact, this map from Murray Lee's Search of Gold Mountain book 
maps Chinatown almost directly to the exact location of the old Stingery District in San Diego. That is the old red light district of San Diego. And Aquin lived right in the middle of Chinatown there on Third Street between Island and Jay. The star that I've marked is not Aquin Tom. He lived right across the street. But the star is the current location of the San Diego Chinese Historical Society. And if you don't know about it, or you haven't had a chance to visit it, I highly encourage you to take a look. It is our sort of um, Chinese hub for exhibitions, both traveling exhibitions as well as core exhibitions. Um, they have wonderful tours to the Asian Pacific Historic District, which you can see also outlined on this map. And they even have a, a self-guided online tool that you can use if you'd like to take your, your own tour of the Asian Pacific historic district and that was made by my colleague Michael Yi. So it's a wonderful place to visit. They are now open and they are giving um, tours and they are open on Fridays, Saturdays and Sundays. Next slide please. When Aquin came down to San Diego, he immediately set up a store and he began recruiting railroad laborers afterwards. Um, and as a lab, uh, railroad labor recruiter, he had many tasks and I'll talk about those in just a minute. This is a slide that shows some Chinese helping to grade the, the ground in Mission Bay in 1881. Next slide, please. If you know the history of the early railroad in San Diego, you know that it began in National City. It went up the coast to Oceanside and then it went east through Fallbrook, Temecula and up to Barstow where it was intended to meet a line coming from the east. And the idea was that San Diego would serve as this wonderful Southern terminus for a competing transcontinental railroad, one that would compete against the, the, the first transcontinental railroad in the North. It didn't work out that way. The engineers didn't listen to the locals in Temecula when they built that railroad track right through that flood zone. Um, and what happened, as many of you know, is that several floods came through and wrecked the tracks. The one that I'm thinking of in particular is the flood that came in February of 1884. Next slide, please. This February of 1884 flood destroyed some 30 miles of railroad track. And for almost a year, the railroad had to, to pause and spend its time repairing that track rather than moving forward. And at this point, Aquin became very important to the railroad recruiting efforts. And here you see on August 4th, 1884, that Mr. Victor, who was the superintendent of the California Southern Railroad, tells Aquin, please go get me 60 people. And again, this is to repair the track that had been driven, that had been destroyed by the torrential rains. Um, I wanted you to have a sense of the scale of his recruitment. 60 people he's being asked to recruit as quickly as possible. So in just a week, he departs. And he would recruit in Riverside, in Los Angeles, and even go as far as San Francisco. And when he went, he used multiple kinds of transportation. Notice on August 11th, he's waking up early. He's taking the stage to San Luis Rey and then on to San Juan. And he, he has to live on the stage all night long. So it's kind of like a red eye, right? He's traveling on a stage all night long. And in the morning he gets to Santa Ana. And here the Santa Ana Hotel gives him access so that he can have breakfast. Not all the hotels would give Chinese access at this time. From there, he takes the train all the way up to Los Angeles. And at this time, he was really working his network. When he arrived in, in Los Angeles, he went to go see Ji Lung. Um, they talked about you know, different people who were around who might be willing to come to San Diego and work on this railroad. He wasn't getting enough people. He'd go to Sam Wall's restaurant and have dinner and talk around looking for laborers, sleeping in the room of one of his friends there and get up the next morning and literally walk on the streets of Chinatown in Los Angeles, looking for people who were willing to come to San Diego to help repair the California Southern Railroad line. Next slide, please. As a labor recruiter, here on April in uh, 10 to 13 in 1884, he also had a trip up to San Francisco and was able to bring home 50 workers, um, but he also shipped goods 
mostly food, up the railroad line to the different gangs that he had recruited. And these are culturally appropriate foods. So he shipped a lot of rice. He shipped a lot of fresh fish, pork, vegetables. He opened a potato farm and farmed potatoes and shipped them up to the different gangs. I think he may have even made more money selling groceries and goods to the railroad gangs than he made off their recruitment to begin with. Um, but he also took care of his workers. Um, he, he delivered their paychecks every two weeks. He had generally a foreman who he would keep in contact with, and then he would collect the pay and then bring it up the track on payday to make sure that they were paid appropriately. And when they were injured, in this case, we have Tom Joy who was, um, he broke his hand is what happened. Aquin takes him back to his own house. Right? You see in this excerpt at the bottom of the slide on May 8th, 1884, he's fallen. This Tom Joy has fallen at work. He broke his hand, so he's not able to work anymore. And Aquin is spending days making arrangements for him to go back to San Francisco, where he probably had friends and family with whom he could coalesce, male family members, with whom he could coalesce. Um, he comes into Aquin's house. Aquin has a wife and a, a one-year-old child at this time, and this laborer, this colleague, if you will, comes into his house and Aquin takes care of him for several days while he's making those arrangements. And he even gives him a gift of $5. You see, it says subscription him $5, almost half a week's salary, just to give him a little padding because he's now not able to work. So these labor recruiters had many more obligations than just bringing laborers to San Diego. Chinese laborers sort of attended the entire package. They, they sent food up to the laborers, kept in touch with them, helped them get transportation to and from San Diego. Next slide, please. This is a, a wonderful excerpt in the diary that shows some of the kinds of relationships that Aquin had with his peers, with other colleagues who worked on the railroad. He takes on June 27, 1884, he takes a stage to National City with another worker, Zhao Ming, and Ah Su, his wife. And notice he says, I and baby Ying, his daughter, and Ah Su, his wife, go into the railroad office after in Robert's house, have a cup of tea, and then go to Mr. Marco's house and have some dinner. So this is a very collegial evening where some of his colleagues from the railroad, presumably white men, have invited not just Aquin, but also his wife and his one-year-old daughter to their home to have some social engagements with them. So it's a wonderful excerpt that shows some of the camaraderie that could be available between a Chinese recruiter and some of his uh, white colleagues. Next slide, please. This kind of camaraderie was not always the case. Here's an, uh, an excerpt from March of 1889, where Aquin is in fact refused entry to one of the boxcars, right? He's in Fallbrook and this Mr. H.L. Silver is the paymaster. And this is a paymaster that Aquin has been working with for months. He appears in the diary several times. So this paymaster knows Aquin and Aquin has gone to accept the pay on behalf of all of his, his uh, recruits, and this paymaster refuses Aquin entrance onto the car where Mr. McCool is sitting. And Mr. McCool is the general manager for the Santa Fe Railroad, for the California Southern Railroad. So apparently he's, you know, kind of too high stature, and this Mr. Silver doesn't think that a Chinese recruiter belongs on the same car with him. Aquin writes in his diary, so I am the first disgrace on today, on ever I work for the California Southern Railroad inside five years. So again, he had very different relationships with his colleagues on the railroad. Some were warm and friendly, um, inviting him even over for dinner, and others were, were much more um, discriminatory. Next slide, please. When Aquin feels like he's financially secure, he goes back to San Francisco, this is 1881, and he marries Asu, Asu Leong, who was living at the time in the Presbyterian Mission Home, when the Presbyterian Mission Home for Chinese Women. Now, Aquin um, 
had probably gone there in September, he tells us. And then he had to wait three months because Asu was rescued from prostitution by this mission home, which was very, very common at the time because of the 1875 federal page law, which restricted all Chinese from coming, Chinese women from coming to America on the pretext that they were prostitutes. It was a self-fulfilling prophecy though, because women, Chinese women were all thought to be prostitutes, the very few women who made it through America's immigration process after 1875 were almost entirely forced into prostitution. Even merchants in San Francisco who were the most powerful people in San Francisco at the time could not protect their own wives from the gangsters who would kidnap them on the streets and then usher them up north into the mines where they wouldn't be heard of before. So Aquin's, um, Asu's story is a sad story, but a common story for that particular time period. When Aquin met Asu at the Chinese mission home in San Francisco in 1881, Asu may have had for one of the first times in her life, the opportunity to make a decision about her own future. When Aquin proposed, the mission gave Asu part of the responsibility for making the decision about whether or not she wanted to marry. And apparently she said yes. And so Aquin was sent away for three months. The mission wanted to make sure that both Aquin and Asu were committed to this marriage. And so he returned in three months in December of 1881. They married. And as they traveled down the coast of California, three separate newspapers announced their marriage. And when they got to San Diego, the San Diego newspaper said, Aquin has returned with a wife and a sack of goods, as though those two things were somehow equivalent. Next slide, please. Together, as uh, Cindy has told us, Aquin and Asu were able to have a beautiful family of 12 children. Cindy's grandfather, George, is their firstborn son. He's the tall son standing there on the, on the right-hand side. He took over Aquin's farming business, his garden business, um, and his produce business. On the far left, we have Thomas with his little chin up. He became the next official mayor of Chinatown. Next slide, please. When we look at the portrait of Aquin and Asu on their wedding day, we imagine a very traditional Chinese couple. But in fact, when you look under the hood, when you look at the diary and you hear the way that Aquin describes their life together, you can see that they were really a very modern couple. Asu, when she came to San Diego, had every reason to believe that she would be um, a merchant's wife who could stay at home and tend her family and not have to work outside the doors of their home. But Aquin, I think, was in fact very ambitious and he wanted his wife to have a side job. So in 1889, he opens a second store. You see in the diary, he says, my wife is helped to charge the store for me. The problem is that Asu already had a full-time job. She had four children and she was pregnant with her fifth. So her job certainly was to keep, to take care of the children and the family as well. What did she do? She packed up all four children, <clears throat> the nanny, lunch, as well as dinner, what he called dinner and supper. And they all walked the five blocks down the central street in, in San Diego's Chinatown to the branch door. And Asu, would be there with the nanny and the children, cook dinner and, and supper um, during the day. She clerked for that store. So she in fact was able to have a separate income for some time, uh, working as a clerk in this store and then later on in the pawn shop that Aquin set on the bottom floor of their home. So the kind of experience that she got working outside the home allowed her to know much more about American customs and courtesies. She was able to gain some independence. And this was um, knowledge that really helped not only in the pawn store that she then ran for decades, but also when Aquin suddenly passed away, she was able to step in and take over the management of his properties. So she was anything but a very traditional wife. She was in fact very progressive and very modern in the sense that she was what we might call a twofer, right? Someone who uh, took care of all the, the domestic duties as well as worked outside the home. Next slide, please. 
Aquin was also progressive for his time. He took uh, an enormous amount of pleasure in his children. And here you see this wonderful pun. He's taking little George. At this time, he's got four or five children and George is four years old. It's 1889 and he takes dearling George on the train and they go out to Lakeside. The, the Cuyamaca and Eastern Railroad had finished a segment and there was a large celebration with some 1500 people and Aquin takes little George, four years old, on the train for this ride. They picnic out at the Lakeside Hotel. And this proud father says, George, he is all right, not cry. So we see he's very, Aquin is very attentive and um, certainly enjoys the time that he has with his child together. Next slide, please. Aquin didn't just take his children out on fun outings. He took care of them at home as well. And here, July 6th, 1889, you see he gets up at 2.45 a.m. This is baby Thomas. My darling is crying. Again, notice the doting language. He has not felt good. Take two hours. My wife also works much on Thomas. So here, Aquin is a wonderful partner, not just during the day, but also in the middle of the night when both husband and wife get up to tend this, this crying child. And it wasn't just the boys that he helped to take care of. Here on February 26, 1891, you see he gets up at 6.15 in the morning and the first thing he notices is it's very cold. What does this father do? He stokes the fire, right? He's afraid that his children are cold. So he stokes the fire in the parlor and he noticed that my dear Maggie, and again, that doting language, my dear Maggie is sick. She's vomiting many times. And it looks like he doesn't need to be asked. It looks like on his own initiative, he takes the day off work and he stays home and watches this vomiting child until noon, after which he probably goes out to tend some of his businesses in the stores. And then he goes and he buys some cloth for the children. And we're not sure if that's cloth that they then used to sew clothes, which they did, or if he was buying ready-made clothes for his children, both again of which he bought. So he did uh, a lot of the grocery shopping. He shopped for, for, for shoes for the children. He took care of them when they were sick. He chose whether they would go to a Chinese or an American doctor when they were sick. So he was really a very, very involved father in the domestic sphere. Next slide, please. As the children are getting older, Aquin is no doubt thinking about what kind of schooling they can have. And this is some of the re recent research I've done. I didn't realize myself that California had established its schools based on a law of segregation. So here in 1860 in California, you'll notice that the California school law stipulated that Blacks, Mongolians, and Indians should not be admitted into the public school system. And there were penalties for doing so. If these entries were reported, then these schools could have their state funding withheld. So you can see that as a huge penalty. Next slide, please. Many of you know that in Chinese American history, a little girl by the name of Mamie Tate sued the segregationist policies and won until she lost, right? She won in 1885 her lawsuit to attend public schools, but then the, Cal the, San, the San Francisco school district passed another law that said that the Chinese, um, anyone who was deemed to be filthy or diseased would be segregated into a school and they categorized Chinese among this group. And then they built a separate Chinese school in San Francisco where the Chinese had to go. So Aquin certainly was following the Mamie Tate case in the mid eighties and he was thinking about where he could send his own children to school. And if you see here, the census in San Diego, the school census of 1891, shows us that there were 8,000 school aged children in San Diego County. Among them, only about 74 black children, 159 Indian children, and according to the record, six school age Chinese children of which half were Aquins. Now, I don't think there were only six Chinese children in San Diego at this time. I think there were six documented Chinese women, uh, children, which is very different, right? The, the anti-immigrant sentiments here were real. 
And so a lot of people like now kind of stay underground, kind of stay under the surface. So there were penalties with staying under the surface in the sense that you might not attend public school. And Aquin here was certainly thinking about whether or not he wanted to send his children to be the only, virtually the only children, Chinese children in a public school in San Diego, where they might be made into a test case, like some of the Chinese children in other cities. And I think he wanted to protect his children. So instead of sending them immediately to a public school, next slide, please. He sent them to a Presbyterian school for Chinese children that was set up by this Chinese mission school. So in San Diego, there were actually five different Chinese mission schools at, at one time, and the Presbyterians were one of them. This is the original Presbyterian chapel that was built in San Diego that was then given over to the Chinese mission school. And the Chinese mission school developed a children's school as an offshoot. And that children's school was maybe not coincidentally located just a block from Aquin's home. And his children attended that school for at least three years before they matriculated into a local public school, the B Street School in downtown San Diego. And I think most of them graduated from Russ High School, which is now San Diego High School in downtown San Diego. Next slide, please. In his later years, Aquin was the unofficial mayor of San Diego's early Chinatown. He, he achieved this distinction because he was seen as a leader of but also as a liaison between Chinese and whites in the city. He was a vast property owner in Chinatown, and he served, as Cindy said, as a translator in San Diego Superior Court. Sometimes that earned him enemies, even from other Chinese. Sometimes the gangsters right, thought that he was acting against them because he was translating. And he always made sure to donate money. He donated to city events. He donated to charities. He donated to natural disasters. He even donated this prized pumpkin that he had farmed to City Hall so that it could be on display for everyone's pleasure. Next slide, please. But all of this work that Aquin did did not come without consequences. In his later years, he also carried this cane with this hidden sword. So we know that he felt sometimes in danger, right? That he felt that he had enemies, that people were, were watching him. And again, when you're, when you're living at an age that is filled with anti-immigrant sentiments, specifically against, in this case, Chinese, we can understand why he felt like he had to protect himself. So one of the things I hope you've been able to track through this talk is that the anti-Chinese sentiment had impacts um, in many, sometimes unexpected ways, right? We talked about the way that San Diego was founded by Chinese fishermen who were driven out of the mines from miners taxes, who eventually were driven out of fishing in San Diego because the 1888 Scott law forbid them from coming back to American shores if they had traveled more than three nautical miles offshore, which is of course what they needed to do when they fished. We talked about Asu and the way that she was impacted by the 1875 Page law that excluded Chinese women and became in many ways a self-fulfilling prophecy. It was trying to prevent prostitution, but in fact forced women who came afterwards into prostitution because of their very, very low numbers. And we talked a little bit about education and not just the segregation law that began in California, but also um, there was a, a, a law in 1892, the Geary Act, which ultimately forced Chinese to carry registration papers, which was both humiliating um, as well as a sign of, of their temporary status, their potentially temporary status. So I know we have some reverberations of some of this anti-immigrant hostility now. These were actions that were taken specifically against Chinese in San Diego you know, more than 100 years ago. And still, Aquin and Asu were able to raise a family of 12. And Cindy will now tell us a little bit more about the legacy of those children. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. And also, thank you for all the work you've done on um, Aquin's diaries. Next slide, please. These are all 12 uh, of Aquin's children. And you can see the dates that they were born and died. 
Um, all the boys are in blue techs. And Auckland was very patriotic. So he named all his sons after American presidents. Um, the second one, George, my grandfather was named after George Washington. And the last one, McKinley, was named after President William McKinley. And um, Aquin felt so confident that McKinley was going to win that he actually named his son before McKinley became president. The first one, Annie, was the first baby, Chinese baby born in San Diego. And Annie ended up getting married at the same place that Aquin and Asu got married um, at the, in the San Francisco Presbyterian Mission Home. And um, then Mabel, number 11, she, uh, she sold uh, prescription, subscriptions for the San Diego Tribune. And she, along with three other people, uh, were the winners. They sold the most subscriptions and she and the others won a car. Next slide, please. This is a picture of uh, the Auckland house. The address I think was uh, 445, but it was on Third Street in downtown San Diego. And you can see on the bottom left corner, there's a big door. And this is where their kitchen was. And they used to open it up and roast a pig in a pit and sell the meat. Um, so they use their kitchen as sort of a, a restaurant at times. And after the last family moved out, um, the property was sold and the building was torn down sometime in the 1960s. Next slide, please. Here is the first family photo taken in 1890. This was eight years after Aquin and Asu got married and already they had five children. And my grandfather, George, is standing on the right. Next slide, please. The second photo was taken inside their family store in 1894. And Aquin wanted his children to have a little culture, so um, they took music lessons. And his oldest daughter played, Annie, played the organ. And then you can see my grandfather on the right with his violin. Uh, the family would often play and sing at their church and, and at uh, community events. Next slide, please. This is a photo of my great grandmother Sue's certificate of residence. Um, during the Chinese Exclusion Act, all Chinese that were not born in America had to carry one to prove their eligibility for residence. Um, we don't have a copy of Ah Quinn's certificate since he was required to give it up when he passed away. Next slide, please. This is a few years later in 1896 and they have nine children at this point. And my grandfather, George is standing in the back row. Next slide, please. This is a family photo of 1900 and it's the one you see most often in the internet and in books. I think because all the children were in it, the last baby, McKinley, was born in 1900. And also because it's the last family photo where some of the girls are still wearing Chinese clothing. Next slide, please. This 1902 photo was their last family photo because I think some of uh, the children started getting married and moving away. Um, as you can see, the children were wearing uh, Western clothing and the girls had bows in their, air, in their hair as typical of uh, girls during their era. And this particular photo was used in a August 29, 1909 San Diego Tribune article. And the article was about the Auckland family. Next, please. These are photos of my great grandmother, Sue. Uh, she liked to wear her Chinese gowns. And um, this is the youngest child, McKinley, sitting on her lap. He's about four and she's about 43. Next, please. 
this is the oldest picture I have of my great grandmother and great grandfather. I'm not sure why they are dressed up, but I probably I probably think that they're going to some family event or uh, a celebration of some sort. Next slide, please. Ackman died in 1914 when a motorcycle rider hit him. And my great grandmother died 13 years later in 1927. And these are some of the Aquin artifacts. Uh, you can see his gold jewelry on the left. And um, on the right, you can see uh, some of the dolls that were in the family. I'm not sure if they were my great grandmother's dolls. Um, but you can see his cane there, his mahjong set, and his abacus. Next slide, please. And this is the last photo I have of my great grandmother. I think she had the photo taken around the time that my great grandfather passed away. She used this particular photo for an immigration document in 1921. And that's how I found it at the Riverside National Archives. So this ends the story of my paternal great-grandfather, Ah Quinn, and a little snippet of his family. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed doing genealogy research on him, and I'm honored to share a little bit about his life. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you both so much. Um, we do have <laughs> a few more minutes for questions. Lots of uh, action in the chat, thanking you folks for a beautiful presentation. So passing that along to you. Um, we don't have any questions in the Q&A yet, but I'm going to share a couple of links in the chat to um, give you a chance to put your questions in. We do have our monthly 101 uh, series will be ongoing next month as well. So you can always check out our events page. Um, I'm going to drop in some of those links that we get asked for a lot. If you would like to see more programs like this or you like this one, please do donate to um, San Diego History Center. That link is in the chat. Um, our events page is also linked for upcoming programs and things that uh, you might wanna check out with us. If you've got a question or you wanna know more about our education or programs, feel free to email us at education. If you wanna volunteer, please email us at volunteer at sandiegohistory.org. Um, and we do get the question a lot about our past programs. Our recordings are available on our YouTube channel. Um, all of our past San Diego 101 programs are on that channel. And um, this one will be on usually within a couple of days, definitely within a couple of weeks. Um, and you can always check it out or share it with friends and family. Um, I do see a couple of questions starting to come in here. So I'm going to drop them in. Um, we've got a question um, that says, you mentioned that the family owned property. Could you say more? Weren't there restrictions against Chinese owning property? Go ahead, Susie. The alien land laws came in a little bit after, I think, Aquin and Asu had already begun buying properties. So I think they were able to own properties prior to 1900 in San Diego. And at one point, Asu was attributed with owning, you know, like the largest single share of Chinatown properties. And they had rentals, you know, uh, housing rentals, as well as business properties for rent. So uh, they they were they got into the real estate even before the alien land laws were passed and so i think in san diego they were able to own some property great thank you got one more that came in on the chat uh were chinese laborers used in late 1800s construction projects such as the hotel dell and the jesse shepherd house uh bill montezuma yes they were and specifically the Hotel Dell, they were. Aquin did not actually contract those laborers, although he's sometimes credited with doing so. I have found no evidence that he did in terms of the Hotel Dell. They were also working on the Sweetwater Dam and they had large, uh, they called them gardens, but they were essentially small farms all over Mission Valley. And even here in, I live in Chula Vista, they were in Bonita. So the Chinese were, were very, um, involved in many different industries in addition to the labor of the railroads. Yes. Thank you. 
Um, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between the Chinese and Japanese populations in San Diego? So in the very early part of history that we're talking about, the 1900 and, and just around that time, uh, the Japanese hadn't come yet. So in fact, the Japanese in many ways across the United States came to replace the Chinese laborers after the Chinese exclusion law had excluded them. So there wasn't a lot of interchange early on. It was you know, sort of cordial. There were very few Japanese coming in as the Chinese were really exiting. So in the early years, there wasn't a ton of overlap between them. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any more questions, so I will give us a chance to wrap up here. And any last questions, please pop them into the Q&A so we can have a chance. We do have a couple more minutes. Um, but as you start to think of a few more questions, I will put in some information about our upcoming program. So we've got our June program um, that you can join us for next month. Um, and that link is in the chat for you too, uh, to join us for Beef and Blossoms about land use in San Diego over time. Um, we do have one more question that came through. Can you talk a little bit more about gender roles um, as, what did you say, alluded to in the chat? Um, oh, I see. A uh, close look at the diaries helps us to reveal the nuances in gender roles against conventional notions. Can you talk a little bit more about gender roles? Wow, there, there's so much to say about gender roles. Um, I can say, this is some of the recent research that I've been doing in the last year or two. I can say when Asu first came to San Diego, I think she really wanted to be a stay-at-home mom, which again, would have been completely expected. But Aquin was traveling. He was working on the railroad to recruit these laborers in San Francisco. So he was often leaving. And at least a few different times she wrote to him and said, you know, essentially come home, the baby is sick. Um, at another time, the, the shop, their pawn shop was set on fire and robbed. And I can understand how fearful she was and Aquin was away and she wrote to him saying, come home right now. And he didn't, you know, he, he was so wrapped up in what he had to do in San Francisco that she really had to sort of manage the fort on her own. So there's just so much to say about gender roles, but my point here is that I don't think she originally wanted to be a twofer. I don't think she really wanted to work outside the home and um, you know, take care of all of her family that kept growing and growing. I think she, she got into that in part because Ah Quinn was ambitious and he didn't want to take anything for granted. I think he really understood that the the anti-immigrant sentiments were very real and whatever income they could make and they could make together would give them a stronger foundation for their future, even if their future ended up elsewhere. So he pushed her, I think, into work. And once she began working and becoming, you know, finding herself so incredibly competent, she ends up advising Aquin. So sometimes he wanted to buy this restaurant uh, in, in downtown San Diego and he talked to his wife about it. He would come home after a business trip and sometimes talk to her for hours and hours in the middle of the night. And she would give him advice, not all of which he liked, <laughs> but he, he, he consulted with her. So they both crossed over into different gender roles and her learning about business allowed her to be kind of a, a partner to him and an advisor to him, even if he didn't always like what he heard. Of course, it added a whole nother level of tension into their marriage, but it was tension obviously that they were able to overcome in order to have you know, this wonderful, fruitful family together. I think also she became a stronger and stronger person as the years went on because uh, it was, it was Asu that was responsible for cleaning up Chinatown and, um, you know, the newspaper articles mentioned her, they didn't necessarily mention Alcorn. Uh, we got a couple more that came in. Um, can you talk a little bit more about, um, so Aquin seems so unusual in how he became American. Did he maintain ties with family back in China or go back to visit at all? So there are rumors that he went back to visit, but I don't think he actually did. There are, and, and Cindy can speak maybe more authoritatively about this. In some of the interviews, at least one, he says he never went back. Uh, and I believe his parents died in the in the 1890s. So by the time 
Aquin and Asu's family are in full force, I think his own family members, his own nuclear family in China have already passed away. So I think there were distant relations. He sent back remittances um, up until you know about 1900. He would send remittances back to his mother, especially, and maybe a dollar for his grandmother. So he did keep ties. But I think after about 1900, uh, after his parents both died, I think those ties loosened. Although, as Cindy will probably tell you, um, maybe I should let, do you want to talk about George and Thomas going back? Well, my uh, grandfather and his younger brother went back to China to uh, find a wife. And uh, they both found one and brought them over. My grandmother uh, was from what they considered a wealthy family only because her father uh, was uh, a pig farmer. And back in China, Meat was very scarce and very expensive. So being a pig farmer, you were actually, uh, you had a pretty wealthy family. Um, and uh, so, but I, I also think that Aquin never went back um, according to some of the immigration documents from his children. They mentioned that he had never gone back as well as Sue, Sue never went back either. And Aquin's younger, brother, uh, that one that stayed in China, died at an early age, so there really wasn't any reason for him to go back. Thank you. Um, and then Let last, just, oh, any last uh, comments or additions? I was just going to add that in, in, San Francis in San Francisco, when he first begins to write the diary, he says, I will probably never see my family again. And so, and, and he says that a second time when he's in Alaska, when he's leaving. So I think he had the sentiment very early on that he wanted to stay in America, that there wasn't much in China for him, given you know, the, the kinds of destruction that, that Cindy had talked about in Chinese history. So I feel like he really wanted to stay if he could. Also because of the Chinese Exclusion Act, a lot of Chinese were afraid to leave uh, thinking that they might not be able to come back in. All right, thank you folks so much. We are at one o'clock, well, 102. So thanks for joining us for an extra couple minutes here and wonderful questions. Um, if we didn't get to yours or if we missed it in the chat, please feel free to email and we can pass it along to these folks so they can give it an answer. Um, if we've got uh, anything that you need to know about or anything that you're still wondering, please do email or check our website and we'll see you next month for San Diego 101 in June. Thank you. Thank you.